Welcome everyone. Um, it's 12.05 and um, we have a fair number of attendees in the room already. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And uh, first I want to welcome everyone um, to Queer and Trans Intersections, Charting New Directions and Publications for the University of Wales Press. My name is Laura Westengard, and um, I'm the board co-chair for CLAGS, the Center for LGBTQ Studies that is housed at the Graduate Center, which is um, CUNY, the City University of New York. So this event will be recorded. I believe you all had to agree to that when you entered the room, but just a reminder, um, this event will be recorded. And so if you have friends or anyone you want to tell about the wonderful information you gathered here today or you want to revisit it yourself, it will be recorded and posted shortly on our CLAG's YouTube channel where you can find archives of all of our amazing free public programming um, over the years. And that archive is growing every year and we welcome you to visit that and take a look at what we've done and what we continue to do at CLAGS. Also, the um, you may have noticed that the chat function is off and will be off for the remainder of this event, but uh, we will have a chance to have a conversation at the end of the program. And so we welcome you to enter your questions or comments in the Q&A section. Um, so you should see Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Click that, enter your questions. Feel free to do that at any point as we go through the program. And during the last half hour, I will go through and, and read out those questions so that our panelists can answer and respond. <clears throat> First, I want to introduce CLAGS. CLAGS was founded in 1991 as the first university-based research center in the United States dedicated to the study of historical, cultural, and political issues of vital concern to LGBTQ individuals and communities. CLAGS nurtures cutting-edge scholarship, organizes and co-sponsors events for examining and affirming LGBTQ lives, and fosters network building among academics, artists, activists, policymakers, and community members. CLAG stands committed to maintaining a broad program of public events, online projects, and fellowships that promote reflection on queer pasts, presents, and futures. But we can't do it without you. Your support of CLAGS is critical to establishing a legacy dedicated to the study of LGBTQ plus historical, cultural, and political issues. Please consider clicking on the link that I will drop shortly in the chat and making a donation to CLAGS today. Your gift affords our community and scholars the opportunity um, to create one of a kind experiences that celebrate scholarship, art and activism from the voices of the LGBTQ community. So whether you're able to give $10, $100 or $1,000, it has significant impact on the lives of our students um, and our community, both now and in the future. So again, um, I invite you to click the link in the chat that I will put right now. So just a moment. This is a one person show at this moment. Let's see here. There we go. All right, um, that is the link to our CLAGS donation page and we invite you to donate whatever you can, share the link with your friends and family and um, continue to keep us in mind whenever you feel like you want to support our important work that we're doing. So now let's turn to our um, amazing panelists that we have here today. I'm just going to briefly introduce them and then turn the show over to them so that we can hear about their work in queer and trans publishing. <clears throat> So um, first, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Ardell Hefeli Thomas, who is the chair of LGBTQ studies at City College of San Francisco. They hold a doctorate from Stanford University in modern thought and literature and specialize in Victorian studies, Gothic studies, and queer and trans studies. 
Ardell's notable books include Queer Others in Victorian Gothic, which is amazing, and Introduction to Transgender Studies, also um, amazing and something that I use frequently in my classroom. Ardell edited a special issue for the Victorian Review entitled Trans Victorians in, in 2018 and is currently editing a companion to the Queer Gothic for Edinburgh University Press and is acting co-editor of the series Queer and Trans Intersections for the University of Wales Press, which they will be talking about today. <clears throat> Welcome, Ardell. Um, Dr. Luke Chawala. Luke, say hi to everyone, is an assistant professor of humanities and culture at Union Institute and University. Everyone, I apologize for the noise that is in my background, but it is my cat. My cat is digging at the wall. <laughs> so we always have to have, you know, a cat interruption in all webinars. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Sorry, Luke. Dr. Luke Chawala is an assistant professor of humanities and culture at Union Institute and University in the PhD Interdisciplinary Studies program. He specializes in 19th century British literature and culture, as well as decolonial and transatlantic queer studies from the 19th through the 21st century. He has a PhD in literature and criticism from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, an MA in English from the City University of New York, Brooklyn College, Woo! CUNY, CUNY alum, <clears throat> and an MA in Public Communications from Fordham University. His most recent work proposes that what he has coined as decolonial queer ecologies as a reparative reading strategy of colonial themed transatlantic Gothic and speculative fiction. He has published work in queer, postcolonial, race, and Gothic studies, including E Tropic and the Victorian Review. He is co-editor of the University of Wales Press new series, Queer and Trans Intersections, and we'll be talking about that today. From the University of Wales Press, we have Sarah Lewis, who is the head of commissioning, and Maria Vasilopoulos, who is global sales manager. So um, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to you all and um, let you get started talking about your exciting work. Welcome. Thank you very much, Laura, uh, for um, uh, organizing this event and um, bringing us uh, to uh, um, CLAGS today to speak about uh, queer and trans scholarship and um, this recent series in University of Wales Press. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, or share my PowerPoint and just give me a minute for that. All right, uh, share. Okay, I think I've successfully shared the screen. Can everybody see the title page? Thumbs up if you can. Yes. All right, so um, welcome to all the participants and thank you for joining us today. And uh, uh, thank you to um, Sarah Lewis and uh, Maria for joining us from University of Wales Press. Uh, thank you, Ardell, um, for all your collaboration on this. And again, Laura and Clags. So I'm um, really excited to talk about uh, this new series, Queer and Trans Intersections um, from University of Wales Press and the ways in which it's charting new directions uh, for queer and trans studies and the different things we um, might think about um, and looking at the future scholarship of queer and trans scholarship, the future direction of queer and trans scholarship. So um, these are some of the trends and challenges that um, we have been discussing, um, Ardell and I, facing uh, queer and trans studies um, of the past um, two decades, but especially the last uh, decade and maybe even more so the last five years. And um, I'm going to turn um, things over to Ardell to uh, speak with you about the first five bullet points there, and then I'll, I'll discuss the uh, second um, five uh, bullet points with you in just a few moments. Um, Ardell? Great. Thank you, Luke. Hello, everybody, and yay, CLAGS. You're just one of my favorite programs, period. So uh, great to see you. It would have been great to be able to go there 
myself at the time when I was uh, working on my master's and my doctorate. Uh, queer studies was not, it was just becoming, uh, you know, a field of study. And so I had to carve my way uh, at the University of Colorado for my master's and then at Stanford. But luckily I had great mentors, um, queer mentors, but actually a lot of wonderful straight allies. So uh, I wanna shout out to all of those folks. Um, so one of the things that I just will go over that um, we've kind of been wrestling with is uh, the future of queer studies and trans studies. And I know at CLAGS, these are co conversations that you all will be have been having. Uh, for some time um, that, and, and I will actually talk very briefly about the book I'm currently editing, editing called uh, Queer Gothic. It's for Edinburgh University Press. And when I was asked to do that, you know, I had this wrestling moment of, should I just go ahead and call it queer and trans gothic? Um, because I'm not sure, again, and I know these are questions you all have been discussing, uh, in, you know, within theory, et cetera, uh, can the queer umbrella really hold up any? And, um, you know, and it depends. It depends on who you're talking to. Um, some theorists are like, no, it's tired. It's worn out, girl. It was so 1990. Lovely then. We can't do it now. But, of course, Munoz argues, well, yeah, if we're looking in the past, it's stuck. But if we are moving forward, right, uh, that uh, we're looking at a queer futurity, then um, then perhaps queer could become its umbrella, it needs to be. But on the other side of that, you have theorists who I've worked with a lot. Um, I work with Susan Stryker. I work with Aaron DeBoer, who's head of the uh, largest transgender archive in the world at the University of Victoria in Canada. Um, I'm often uh, part of the Moving Trans History Forward Conference as a delegate. And in those circles, there is a huge move to move towards trans studies, <clears throat> excuse me, as a separate category. So that's part of why when we started formulating the ideas, um, Sarah Lewis reached out to me about a year and a half ago and said, Ardell, would you be interested in editing a series for us? And I said, yes, absolutely. And I want to bring Luke in as the co-editor. So that that's how all of that happened. But my main question was, I'm not sure about this umbrella of queer holding. And so, you know, there there are you know, we're seeing a split. And at the same time, obviously queer and trans aren't completely disparate topics, right? Although obviously we know sexual orientations and gender identities um are are different, right? And they come to us differently. Of course, uh, given all these sexologists in the 19th century, et cetera, these things often got conflated. So anyway, blah, blah, you don't need a lecture from me. But that's why we, we've gone ahead and pulled them queer and trans uh, to look at it in that way. In my own scholarship and with my own students, um, although yes, I'm at a community college, uh, the LGBT department at City College is unusual. And I know you all will appreciate that in that I get a lot of folks who already have a bachelor's degree or even master's degrees coming in to step back and get that AA in queer studies. Um, I tend to use the term queer just as a punctuation or not a, a shortening of it. Um, that and I identify as queer, I am also transgender or trans, non-binary trans. So uh, anyway, queer and trans. Um, and then we've got the next one, which is the acronym, which, I mean, we all kind of joke, the alphabet soup, but it does grow. Um, we've, I'm sure, forgotten uh, a letter or two. Um, and I do personally feel the two is so important because that does also include two-spirit identity. And here in the Americas in particular, right, that one, um, that is so important. And Canada is far ahead of us usually with uh, with these things. You don't see the two in the U.S. as much. In Canada, it's almost always included as, uh, as part of it. But there are um, all of these attempts to represent all sexualities uh, across time and space and um, genders and sexualities. 
So it can get kind of cumbersome and at the same time, we must do this. We must look at this true diversity um, and come out of sort of these Western Eurocentric, I'm, I'm moving into the next one, um, the Eurocentric and Western appropriations, queer settler colonialism, and these complete Western words, right? So that, you know, there's so many cultures that have their own languages. One of our amazing uh, editorial board members, Quo Lee Driscoll, who uh, they are two spirit, they're a professor at Oregon State University. And uh, they have an outstanding theoretical book that came out about three years ago, uh, Asagi Stories. And this is uh, Asagi being the term for Cherokee, uh, two spirit identity. And I think that, you know, interrogating the Eurocentric and Western terms, when are they useful? Um, in cases of asylum, right? Like sometimes you have to use that. So it's an ident identifier uh, globally, it's understood. And yet what happens when we try to make that the one, you know, dominant uh, set of words, the dominant paradigm, right? And that's just reinstating in many ways a Eurocentric and Western uh, lens and a notion of a supremacy there, which I think we, we need to break that. We need to get through that. And that also goes on to uh, BIPOC conversations and future directions and representation for, of, and by Black, uh, Black, Brown, and Indigenous uh, and people of color. And again, this is, and your program at CLAGS um, already does some amazing stuff in these areas. And this is, we're truly interested um, and want to do what we can as a brand new series to foster and foster maybe the wrong word there, right? But to encourage and let's get voices out there. We want this to be a platform um, of quote unquote, not the usual suspects, if you will, uh, right? I mean, nobody needs to hear from me too much anymore, okay? Um, you know, the, the the white queer trans person in their 50s. It's like, okay, whatever. I, I said my piece. But, you know, the voices have to, we have got to, we have to do that. And we have to work better with that. Um, and finally, <clears throat> um, gender, sexuality, and disability studies. Um, I was really reminded there's an amazing uh, young professor, um, uh, Jeremy Chow. And he's doing a lot right now with, uh, queer disability studies and um, the the ways that min, much of the language in all of those disciplines come together. So this is, uh, we want to look at rethinking perspectives regarding embodiment and desire <clears throat> in that area as well. By the way, um, Luke will do the next grouping, but I just want to say these are just ideas, right, that you know, any any publication group, it's just like any call for a conference, puts the ideas out there. But there are ideas that you have that we haven't thought about. And so this isn't like, oh, anything has to fit something here. There are so many other things. So I just, I want to open that up. And now, Luke. Thank you, Ardell. Yes, I, I want to reiterate what Ardell said. Um, uh, when I was thinking about these um, 10 different areas of uh, trends and challenges in queer and trans uh, scholarship, I was mostly thinking about how we have moved past this, like, I, I suppose I'll call it first wave of queer criticism with Michelle Foucault and Judith Butler and Eve Sedgwick. And now we've moved into this 21st century um, concept of intersections of identity with uh, queer and trans scholarship, right? And what, what are people starting to look at now in the last two decades, and especially um, in um, the last decade, uh, and, um, and ideas that uh, move beyond a Eurocentric uh, Western understanding of um, queer thought and identity. But there's certainly lots of other areas that are new and exciting, uh, which we're hoping to uh, hear about as we explore other opportunities uh, for our series. Uh, so, 
Yes, in in the past few years, there have especially been some uh, there has especially been some scholarship and research on uh, queer indigenous studies. I'm thinking of not only Quiley Driscoll but Scott Luria Morganson and um, settler colonialism and uncovering the ways that the radical fairies, for instance, in the 80s and 90s were adopting indigenous cultures to try to justify their um, queer identity, and um, and mostly these were um, appropriations made by a white uh, gay men and, and lesbians, right? And this has been interrogated widely. And uh, we're, we're starting to move uh, beyond um, beyond this scholarship now into understanding of First Nations peoples in Canada and the ways that the Canadian government has been exploiting uh, Indigenous uh, people um, in their understanding of queer identity and, uh, and sexual sexuality and gender identity. Um, but uh, the last five um, points that I want to speak with you briefly about uh, deal mostly with decolonial intersections of decolonial and queer stuff. I'm uh, sorry, decolonial and uh, ecological studies, right? Um, which is a special interest of mine. And so, what I'm thinking about especially is how uh, queer theory. And I have some notes I'm going to be looking down from from time to time. So please excuse me for that. But uh, queer theory and LGBTQ activism and uh, uh, queer globalizations have been reinforcing whiteness and empire over time. And how can we interrogate this and move away from this, uh, looking at the future of queer and trans scholarship? Um, and specifically, uh, looking at the global south might be useful and Asia, Asia Pacific, the Middle East, Africa and South America, where um, largely groups of uh, queer and trans peoples have been neglected or defined by Western and European notions of um, uh, sexuality and gender identity. Right? Um, so we might think about uh, ways in which um, we, we, and when I say we, I mean everyone identifying LGBTQIA plus peoples and allies can um, fight for the rights of um, queer and trans peoples in the global south uh, and help them to acknowledge their existence without pushing upon them Western um, signifiers and ideas, concepts, cultures of what it means to be queer and trans. So how do we balance that? And um, what, what, what can scholarship teach us about that, hearing from people in these areas and writing um, in these areas? How can we decolonize Western conceptions of sexuality and gender in these places and leave these cultural areas open to define their own sexualities and gender identities? And this leads me into um, ideas in which, the ways in which uh, queer and uh, trans uh, diasporic decol uh, decoloniality is moving towards um, decolonial queer diasporas. So um, there are many um, people identify as queer, trans, LGBTQIA+, uh, around the world that have been displaced in diasporas. But uh, in, in the past three decades, um, there, there have been attempts to define them through Western European ideas of what sexuality and gender mean. And now people in the, um, in, that have uh, been displaced in, in diasporas are trying to decolonize from these concepts and redefine their own understanding of gender and sexuality, sometimes going back to um, indigenous roots or cultures and rediscovering this past for themselves. So um, an example might be how um, one might identify as, specific, uh, as Pacific Islander and queer, but they're raised in a Western um, setting in a Western diasporic setting. How how does that community discover what it means, um, what their sexuality and gender means in an environment that has been so defined by Western European culture and scholarship? So that's what I'm thinking about there with decolonizing queer diasporas. Right? Uh, especially since the publication of the anthology Queer Ecologies in 2010 by Katarina Mortimer Sandlands and Bruce Erickson, there's been an increasing interest in the ways in which gender identity and sexuality can be understood within environmental politics and how how we might move towards queering environmental politics. And in fact, I, um, I recently discovered that in 2016, um, Cooney held a, a workshop on looking at um, queer geographies, for instance, and the ways in which uh, uh, heterosexism organizes um, architecture in society. So this is uh, one example of um, how people are using queer ecologies. 
Uh, but some other um, ways that uh, people have been interrogating uh, the ideas of nature in human in the environment are by looking at toxic discourse right, in the environment and sex panic, biophilia, involution, melancholy natures, um, access to natural spaces for LGBTQIA plus peoples, queer nature cultures, the ways in which um, uh, an understanding of nature and culture uh, alongside queer identity uh, work in tandem to, uh, to uh, identify um, queer futures. Uh, spatial organization of um, sexuality and gender in cities, I, I already said queer geographies, uh, the idea of symbiosis and the ways in which eco, uh, we can look at ecosystems um, as a metaphor for the ways in which human cultures might work and how everything is interdependent, right? Coalition building within groups of people in the environment, queer animals, ecosystems. Um, I'm thinking of Elizabeth Freeman's term here, erotohistoriography. historiography and uh, queer environmental futurity. So these are some concepts that come to mind that have been emerging uh, as a special interest in um, queer and trans ecologies and especially the last decade of scholarship. Healthcare access and discrimination has become a particularly um, uh, area of interest, a particular area of interest for queer and trans scholarship, especially uh, following COVID-19 pandemic and um, monkeypox, right? And so um, I was looking for how I would speak to you about this, and I, uh, I uh, found this passage I'm going to read to you briefly about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted queer and trans discrimination. Right? In Uganda, Police detained some 20 LGBT homeless youth on spurious charges of breaking COVID-19 restrictions and tortured them in prison. In the Philippines, village officials humiliated LGBT people while enforcing curfew. In South Korea, so social media users scapegoated LGBT people after some media linked an outbreak to gay clubs. In Panama, police and private security officials discriminated against transgender people while enforcing a gender-based quarantine. Hungary's populist leader, Viktor Orban, used COVID-19 emergency powers to rush through discriminatory legislation against transgender people. So often people are not realizing how queer and trans people have been targeted during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then there's the whole idea of how a lot of um, queer and trans, especially queer and trans people of color, um, tend to uh, lack the healthcare care. Uh, lack the healthcare access that they need in fighting a pandemic or um, are struggling with supporting themselves. Um, I'm, I'm also thinking about queer and trans homelessness, right? And um, LGBTQ youth homelessness and, and the resources that are needed uh, for that through a pandemic. Uh, the idea of monkeypox and, and how it's interesting how, um, you know, if you compare that to the HIV AIDS crisis of, of the 1980s, how that was handled a little differently this time, uh, and people were a little bit more careful not to place blame um, or afraid to place blame with uh, men who have sex with men, but how there was responsibility taken with that community to get vaccinated and to try to end that pandemic. And in fact, just this morning, I read an article on the BBC about that, right? How monkeypox was uh, eradicated much more quickly or were facing a threat from it. Um, because it was handled differently um, from the HIV AIDS crisis in, in many ways. And um, of course, we can't forget to, about how um, the politics, and I, I, I see this especially in the United States, um, how politicians are using queer and trans bodies for votes and um, the regulation of uh, medications and healthcare access and what we might think about this in terms of scholarship. Right? And around the world, there has been legislation for banning um, LGBTQ adoption, um, discussion of LGBTQ ideas, elimination of uh, books in libraries, for instance, and, and discussions of LGBTQ identity, like in Florida and in Texas. So these are all emerging ideas recently that uh, scholarship is starting to become interested in or should be interested in, um, in, in thinking about conversations and solutions to these problems. And lastly, um, you know, especially in the last decade at conferences I've been to, there have been a lot of presentations and discussions around how um, new media in the age of the internet has changed um, community building uh, for LGBTQ people. So um, I, I recall a paper, it's, uh, 
that was presented one time at a conference I was in Australia on what would Heidegger think of Grinder, for instance, you know, in, in this age of uh, people connecting and not just for hookups, but um, also for networking and social media in, in ways that um, are different from the traditional environment of um, uh, gay bars or LGBTQ community centers in the past and how these are becoming um, less and less places for community building. Uh, so a particular area of um, interest for me is um, how people are building slash fandoms on, on the internet and imagining um, characters that are heterosexual in, um, in franchises such as Harry Potter and Star Trek, for instance, and, and reinventing their own fiction to try to reclaim agency and show visibility. Um, uh, using shipping and queer and trans fan fiction, how forums and websites are being built, blogs or spaces for open communication and, um, and worlding and community building. So what do we do in this, in this new age of interaction in the LGBTQ community when, um, for instance, lesbian bars are becoming increasingly less visible across the United States? I think there are now 13. Uh, last time I checked, one of which is in Columbus, my home city. And um, and especially after the COVID-19 pandemic, how um, bars have been closing for LGBTQ community building. Uh, in my home city of uh, Columbus, for instance, in the last four years, we've gone from 24 to 12, right? And so what spaces are there um, open for people to uh, create alliances and coalitions and um, and find spaces for conversations. How is that different in our age of global media, especially? And how is global media impacting other areas of the world outside of uh, the Western world and the global South? Um, do we have a responsibility for uh, considering how how we influence their cultures or how they're able to use our media? Uh, do we need to provide more access? These are just some ideas I'm thinking about for the um, trends and challenges that uh, might be facing queer and trans scholarship uh, that we hope to see um, in our uh, new series from the University of Wales Press. Of course, as Ardell said, these are just some, uh, a group of 10 categories of ideas uh, of challenges and trends, and there are surely far more. Right? I'm going to go to the next screen now where Ardell is going to talk to you about some of our objectives uh, for the series at the University of Wales Press. Sorry, my cat. Uh, it looks like Laura and I have a similar problem with the cat today. Anyway, my cat never jumps on my lap during a Zoom, but she decided to do that just now. Yeah, they do. Uh, anyway, um, so we're looking at uh, intersectional, interdisciplinary, and global approaches, the sexual and gender diversity in the past, present, and future. Um, to capitalize on the LGBTQIA2 plus studies and the evolving market around the world. Um, Luke, am I doing this whole slide? Okay. Yes. Um, thank you. To expand LGBTQIA2 plus queer trans theories and writing globally with particular focus on global regions that are often ignored. Um, that goes back to the global south um, and to other areas, right now there's some amazing work being done um, in Pacific Island studies, Pacifica, Oceania studies, et cetera. Actually, I work with one of the pioneers of that area um, at City College. And there's just so much. I do want to, while we're talking about the global though, take it back to another um, topic that, we didn't pinpoint directly, but as I was sitting and listening, I was thinking, you know, we're also incredibly open to rural spaces, spaces that are not usually discussed in these contexts, whether they're rural in the uh, U.S., um, in, you know, in the Americas, in Asia, in um, Europe. I mean, that often <clears throat> queer and trans cultures and whatnot look different in those rural spaces. Uh, the bars, that's what kind of got me thinking about this, um, that often, I, I spent one year in Kentucky. Um, I can't tell you how dreadful that was, but it was. I grew up in Oklahoma, 
I like escaped Oklahoma. And then uh, my first tenure track job actually wound up in Kentucky for one year. I don't know, even know how I got through one year, but um, uh, no, and sorry if anybody's from Kentucky, but it was also very interesting because the ways that uh, queer and trans social structures work in smaller places, right? Um, and that people are hungry for community and hungry for queer and trans stuff. Um, it's also, at least in Lexington, Kentucky, was at the time very divided uh, by racial lines. And so it was just, uh, I mean, it was, it was kind of wild to be there. But that, you know, what does it look like in Appalachia? What does this look like in, like I said, rural places? Um, and this is also goes into sometimes uh, asylum issues, right? That, and that goes back to the whole Eurocentric notion of what is, what do queer and trans even look like? Um, and interrogating that because um, being queer or trans can be life or death for people. Um, we just had two people put to death in Iran uh, in the last three weeks and because they were queer. And, um, um, you know, but being queer in certain places may not look to an asylum court like really being queer. What does that even mean? Um, I've done some work on this, but uh, there's a there's a whole area to explore there, and and again, rural places are places that one doesn't immediately think about. Right, this isn't just about urban spaces, um, although I think that that's where we often tend to think of. You know, where where is there a more visible community? Um, and uh, to expand uh, the writing globally. Um, and we also are really excited because the University of Wales Press uh, is not going to be as known to you, to this specific audience. Um, it is also the Chicago University Press in the United States is, um, works with Wales as the distributor. But, um, one of the reasons I was so excited to be approached about Wales is I've worked with them. And in fact, I have another monograph in the works with them on AIDS and AIDS Gothic. Um, <clears throat> and they're just fantastic to work with. So I can talk more later about particularly why, if you're looking at advanced graduate students and you're looking at monograph and whatnot, why this is actually a really nurturing and fantastic press to work with uh, for a first volume. Um, and we're wanting it to become a great choice for you, uh, PhD students willing to publish excellent quality revised doctoral theses in your field of study. <clears throat> and then also introductory volumes as well as specific ones advancing the field of research. So um, we're embarking on this new adventure and it's always a big risk for a press to say, hey, why don't we do this particular series? I also want to at this time say that two years ago, was it two years ago to three, the pandemic, I, I swear my, my timeline is just gone. I guess I'm in Halberstam's queer time and space. I don't know, probably. But anyway, um, three years ago, actually, um, Columbia University Press had a queer and trans wing, Harrington Park Press, which did some amazing stuff. And it was literally run by one person, Bill Cohen, who actually, uh, he's the one who commissioned my Introduction to Transgender Studies, which is an introductory book. Obviously, it's not a graduate level book, but um, it's the first introduction to the field of studies. And um, anyway, right as I was ending that process, uh, Bill, who really was a one person shop, um, he died suddenly. So Columbia University Press, uh, which is right there where you are, um, Columbia University Press had this great, um, you know, pocket, and now they don't. So, <clears throat> you know, we lost that. And I just, you know, I, I want to say that I, I think this is awesome. And that, you know, University of Wales, it, you know, it is a smaller press. But, but what comes with a smaller press 
And I've now published numerous things, not just books, essays, edited things, etc. A smaller university press is actually often a fantastic way to go because they work with you. And the people at that press are the same people I worked with on my very first monograph over a decade ago. That is good. You want that consistency because I've worked with another huge press who shall remain nameless um, on a very different book. And um, my, my editorial staff changed three times. And there was no marketing for my book. And what I have to say to you about Wales is that every conference that the, the, the book series that Wales has, whether it's Gothic or horror, or in this case, it's going to be queer and trans, they're there with the books and representing. They are always there. They're always representing. And they always get back to you on email. They actually talk to you and communicate. And so there are two presses uh, that I would work with again and again, and University of Wales is definitely one of them. Um, okay, so there was my UWP pitch, but it's it's true. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ardell. So um, I'm going to talk to you uh, next uh, about the next slide, but before we move on, I, I did want to say I was excited to um, come to CLAGS and speak to, I, I'm assuming, a lot of people in the audience might be um, students or members of the City University of New York, because I myself um, went to Brooklyn College and I attended many CLAGS events. And I, I know that there are many courses offered, for instance, at the Graduate School on um, Queer Studies, uh, bringing people from across the, uh, the city sometimes in, into events. Um, and there, there are courses themed around um, intersections of queer and trans identity. And so what I see this is a wonderful opportunity for doing is contributing to a volume of essays in which uh, one or two um, students or faculty members might edit a volume of um, scholarship that comes out of such a course. And so it's just something I thought about right now as Odell was speaking. So I'm going to speak to you about uh, examples of potential volumes, and, and there was one idea that I was talking about right there, but um, I have up some images here that I just uh, put together and copied these images into, um, into this uh, PowerPoint slide, and I don't have um, the, uh, the citations for them because it would have um, sort of clouded and cluttered the slide a little bit, but I do have them linked right here, and I have sent those links uh, with that um, with that uh, bibliographic information to Laura, who's going to um, uh, drop that into the Q&A or chat for you at, at some point, if you would like to look at those images further. But just in the last, um, what is it, seven years, from 2016, here's some of the conversations that have been emerging at, um, at um, seminars or roundtables or keynotes, right? Uh, that we, we see uh, emerging. There's one, uh, Queer Ecologies, uh, CUNY, in 2016, held a um, panel discussion on the queer politics and metabolism of the city and looking at ge queer geographies. And in, um, in 2000, I don't have the years exactly, but somewhere, I, these two are in like 2020, 2021, um, there, there was a round table on um, the place of black and queer trans studies, I believe at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of uh, Technology, um, that was uh, considering um, uh, how people of color fit into this conversation and uh, perhaps how they've been neglected um, from the LGBT community in the past, people of color. And I'm reminded of um, the ways in which uh, pride um, Prades of the past few years have um, people have splintered from them to create the uh, the People's March, right? Because of uh, the consumerism and capitalism that had been flooding Pride parades that had been ignoring um, people of color and especially trans people of color. And um, so I, I'm curious. I mean, I, I wasn't at that event myself, but how many conversations were around that idea and, and others like it? And um, then in Norway. I, I forget the, the name of the university, but that will be shared with you in the chat, as said. Uh, just recently, I think this was 2022, there, there was a roundtable on uh, global queer movements and perspectives of the global south on ideas that I had just um, discussed with you uh, previously. And in 2021, uh, 
Fadi Sela, and this YouTube video is actually available online uh, through that link, and you can watch it, um, spoke about um, uh, queer and trans refugees uh, coming out of Syria, especially in the Middle East and the humanitarian uh, crisis there. So you could see a lot of these things that I, uh, I and Ardell spoke with you about earlier are trending uh, across the world in roundtables and speakers events. And I don't see them uh, very much represented in publications uh, to the extent uh, that they should. And so we're hoping that uh, we might we might um, in this series, uh, we welcome and we hope that we will get some expressions of interest for um, volumes on queer and trans issues in the global south. These ideas I have listed there, diasporas, indigeneity, ecologies, disabilities, the fantastic in the arts, decoloniality, trauma, and medicine. Um, and I want to speak to you a little bit about uh, the fantastic in the arts. Some of you may be um, familiar with um, this organization, the International Association for the Fantastic in the Arts, which holds a conference uh, annually in March in Orlando, Florida, and have begun holding one online as well in the fall. Uh, and so recently there is a caucus on BIPOC studies, right? Uh, and so this idea of intersections of um, uh, BIPOC identities and queer and trans issues ha have been surfacing at that conference, which I, I attend um, on a regular basis. And um, ideas about worlding, especially, uh, have become um, of interest to people in the last few years, looking at the ways in which speculative fiction, gothic fiction can help us reimagine queer and trans identities and empower communities, help us think differently about the futures of sexuality and gender. So all of these are potential directions for monographs and edited volumes um, that we're hoping to see um, move into this exciting future of queer and trans uh, studies. And so uh, let me go to the next slide. Uh, we're going to talk to you about publishing with University of Wells Press now for this um, series, Queer and Trans Intersections. And I've I listed a few bullet points there for you on steps that one would take uh, um, if they're interested in publishing uh, with this series, the University of Wells Press. But I'm going to um, uh, hand things over to uh, Sarah Lewis and uh, Maria to speak with you um, about this process. Well, thank you very much, Ardell and Luke and Laura, for arranging this. Um, we're really honoured to be here and to be involved in the series. Um, I think Luke and Ardell have done an admirable job of explaining its aims and objectives. And there's massive food for thought, I think, about the sort of um, books which might appear in it. Um, I just want to talk just very briefly about the University of Wales Press. We are small. Um, we do have, and Maria can speak about this um, with more detail than I can, but we do have the University of Chicago Press who do our marketing and distribution in key territories, including the United States. Um, we're, we're 100 years old this year, the University of Wales Press, and we were born actually from a place of marginality as an outlet for scholarship about Wales and in Welsh. And we were basically locked out um, by reasons of um, religion and language. So I think we do understand um, marginality. We think this is a really important series um, for the press, but also for all the reasons that Luke and Ardell have outlined. I think it's a pressing um, global concern and we really want to be um, part of that. We publish authors right from the beginning, um, ECRs right through um, to um, retired scholars and independent scholars. And we must say that um, ECRs do hold a special place in our heart. We know um, that this will be your first book. And what we try to do is offer guidance and explanations of all the steps that are involved in publishing a book. And um, I think Ardell spoke very kindly about the press. And I think we um, do try very hard to ensure that author care is right at the top of our priorities. So if you send us an email, we'll reply to you and we'll try to do it in a very timely way. But also when we reply, we hope that our replies are giving you the information and guidance that we need. We also understand the importance of that first book. Um, we hear so much in the UK, and I think it's probably similar in the USA about um, precarity for um, young academics. We know how important that monograph is. So if we can help you on your way to your academic career with a book contract and then a published book, 
we are absolutely thrilled to do so. Also, I think what we recognise is that you're trusting us with your manuscript, which is often the result of years of work. And you're basically venturing into unknown territory up to a point by handing over your work to a publisher. So I think we're very sensitive to that too. And we'll always do the best for you and your book. Um, slide five has set out um, briefly the various steps in the procedure. The first one being, if you've got an idea, please do send an expression of interest to Ardell and Luke um, with a synopsis. And it basically sets out really what the synopsis should include. What we want to do is get a sort of reasonable overview at that stage of what the book's about. Um, and if it's an edited volume, it would be nice to have some tentative chapter titles and who is going to write those um, chapters. But before you even get to that stage, for an ECR, I imagine your first book is going to be based on your thesis. Um, like many academic presses, we don't publish an revised thesis. So there will be an expectation that the thesis is revised as and how it's needed to be to transform in a, into a monograph. Um, and again, we know that you've spent years doing your thesis and then some publisher comes along and asks you to change it. But we try and guide you and support you through all that. So basically, you may have to revise the work fairly thoroughly. The thesis can certainly be a starting point, and it often is. Um, it can involve um, broadening the subject matter, restructuring the manuscript so that it concentrates more on original research and less on literary review and methodology. Um, updated content can be incorporated um, relating to further research that you've done when, after you've finished your thesis. Um, it tends to be a broadening of scope uh, to make the monograph and the author's research relevant to a wider audience. Um, the potential readership for monograph is bigger, it's a different audience, whereas your thesis is really for um, obviously to get your qualification and for your PhD supervisors. So we are talking about um, two different um, audiences um, that the original research is um, intended for. Also, I'd, I'd always advise that um, you try and avoid jargon if you can. I know it's difficult when you're talking about theory and it can take years of writing to get that confidence to write in a more accessible way, but we'd um, encourage you to do so if you can. And one of the bigger, uh, one of the main differences that can be between a thesis in, and a monograph is a thesis tends to be longer than a monograph would ideally be. So you may have to cut some um, extents as, as well. So once you've thought about how you're going to change your thesis into um, a monograph, um, I should say as well, there's some excellent guidance out there. There's a book that I always recommend to people published by Chicago, which is from um, dissertation to book by William Germana, which is a really nice, um, overview into what happens and how publishers think. And I, it's um, available on Amazon for about $10. So that is always a good book to dip into. Um, your, so once you've thought about how you're going to transform your thesis into a monograph, you think about um, contacting Luke and Ardell, and you're talking about the overview that you're going to um, put into a synopsis. So you need a working title sort of an abstract overview of the proposal to include a description of content, aims and objectives, theoretical underpinnings, target market, how will it contribute to the scholarly debate, how it differs from any similar works, if there are any, and also um, broadly number of words, which should include text, notes and bibliography, but not the index. So as the slide says, we then discuss it between ourselves. And if it's one, that we'd like to take further. University of Wales Press holds commissioning meetings um, regularly. So having talked to Ardell and Luke, I go to the commissioning meeting, say I've got this fantastic proposal, this idea for the QTI series. Um, I'd like to ask the author um, to complete a formal proposal questionnaire, which we send out the peer review. Um, interestingly, we had a meeting today. We had a fantastic example um, since the meeting and Maria was there. At the meeting, it looked very, very narrow indeed. And we thought, oh, this is not gonna work as a monograph. It's far too narrow. I know the supervisor, so I had a chat with the supervisor and it turns out that the intention of the book is, is to be quite a lot broader. 
So I think in this case, we, we had um, an ECR who basically drastically undersold their work. So hopefully now we can go back to this author. So I've had a chat with your supervisor. I can see now that is intends to be broader in scope. So really try and think about how a publisher looks at a proposal um, and put in place what you actually intend and think about what you're saying is really important. In the proposal questionnaire, we've got a formal proposal questionnaire, which most academic presses has have. It's an absolutely vital document and it needs to be completed with care and detail. So I'd say take your time. Even if you write to me and say, oh, Sarah, it's going to take me two months. I'd rather that you take the time that you need, do it properly, because that is the document the peer review and the peer reviewer will be using to evaluate this proposal. So it's really important that it's done properly. It's used by basically all departments at the press. And the idea is to give us an overview of the book, not just the content, but also who the market is, um, what conferences might be relevant to it. It en enables me to tell the production department how many um, pages it's going to be, because we do a budget for books as well. So basically, it's got to be um, balanced, um, detailed, and basically tell the peer reviewer what you really want to say about that book. Basic, remember that this is what the peer review will base their judgment on. So it's your opportunity to impress the reviewer. I always say to people, if, if you're describing your book to me, I can ask you questions, but a peer reviewer has this document in front of them, you're not there. So I'd really make it clear. Um, first of all, remember, as I touched on originally, the peer reviewer will be looking at at it as a monograph, not a thesis. They are distinct with a different audience. Um, and I'd also say if it is based on a thesis, I just put a short statement in saying, this research is based on a thesis, but I intend to transform it into a monograph by doing X, Y, and Z. And I think that's um, something that appeals to peer reviewers. So when you're writing a proposal, think about the title. Often a thesis has quite a sort of academic -y kind of title as it would, but um, this is where the power of metadata comes in. And Maria deals with this all the time and can, again, speak in a lot more detail. So what I'd always advise is the main title of the book succinctly describes the book and basically says what it's gonna do. So it can be um, Gothic horror in the 20th, 21st century or queer um, and trans um, experiences in the global south. You can have a subtitle which is more playful and creative, but with the main title, think that is if I'm um, looking for a book on a particular area, you want your book to come very high up in any search return or on Amazon or wherever you're trying to purchase a book. When you're doing the proposal as well, think about the content, same as objectives, I'd always advise people to almost put an abstract um, as the first paragraph, this book proposes to. So if you're a peer um, a commissioner like me, I want to go in and know immediately what that book's about. And I think the peer reviewer will want to too. I've had quite a lot where you go through a couple of pages and I find a sentence. I think, God, right, that's what that book's about. Now I understand. Put that right up front so there's no doubt. Um, in my mind or the peer reviewer's mind what the book's about. Make sure it's well developed and detailed and you don't want to fail on vagueness. Um, so even if something's quite clear to you, it's worth setting, out, setting it out very expressly in your proposal um, what you intend to do. I think one of the most common things I get from peer reviewers is, mm, I think the author intends to do this, but I'm not sure. So make sure they're sure. So even if it's plain to you, put it down very expressly in your um, proposal. So the aims and objectives, they need to be um, full and detailed, not suggestive really of what the book might contain. So that's why I'm thinking that any um, proposal, by the time you fill in the proposal, you should have a pretty clear idea um, what you think this book is going to look like. I'd also um, definitely recommend adding a table of contents. So chapter title with a description 
of what each chapter will contain and what it seeks to do and how it um, promotes and develops the argument which flows through the book. Um, and that will show the peer reviewer what the structure of the book will look like. And again, it gives them a much clearer idea of what um, you have in mind and what the book you intend to write will look like. So it needs to be convincing in a number of ways. So it needs to be intellectually convincing, so not overly descriptive. It needs to demonstrate scholarly depth. It needs to be theoretically convincing. It needs to include information on the theoretical concepts which underpin the research. It needs to show what its originality and rigor is. Um, and it needs to engage in the current state of play um, and scholarship in your field. And one of the um, things I find most often with a thesis, which has been developed into a monograph, is between finishing the thesis and sending the book proposal in, there could have been some more publications in your area. And again, it's a, it's a quite common peer reviewer comment. Um, they haven't engaged in current scholarship since the thesis was finished. XYZ has been published, which they need to address and engage within the book. If you've got any supporting material, such as the draft chapter, particularly the introductory one, I'd encourage that as well, but it's not 100% um, necessary. I always like a conclusion. Peer reviewers like them. They like a nice way sort of rounding off the book. And um, we just like to know what your conclusions are and how you're wrapping up the argument, even if it's uh, quite brief. It must be groundbreaking in some way, your book. So it could be that it's the first book length treatment of this area. It considers aspects which haven't been considered before or questions which aren't previously considered. And I've got to say with this series, I think there's massive scope for developing really groundbreaking work. And um, as Laura said, as we um, opened the session, you know, about the legacy. And I really hope this series is gonna really help with the legacy in this really important area. So I think it's a massive opportunity for everybody who's researching in this field. And we hope this series is gonna be an excellent home to it. So know your market as well. Uh, demonstrate an awareness of competing titles and how your book is different. Um, knowledge of the intended readership, and that will help us evaluate the proposal too. I'd always say it's pretty obvious, but ask somebody to edit the proposal, um, avoid typos. Um, I always think for a peer reviewer, probably on a Saturday afternoon or evening when everybody's enjoying themselves, a peer reviewer is probably looking at your proposal when they've got a spare half hour or so to start looking at it and start writing the um, proposal. So you don't want to irritate them by sloppy presentation. So do your very best to make sure it's, um, it looks um, in a good state um, from presentational point of view. And that includes um, grammar and syntax, et cetera. As regards to word count, I'd say 80, 90,000 words, maybe 95, including all text notes and bibliography. Um, and then what we do, we send it out to the peer reviewer once we've got it, Ardell and Luke will have a look at it, and if we think it's ready, um, they will recommend a peer reviewer to me, so I send it to the peer reviewer. And what we're basically asking the peer, peer reviewer, would you recommend this book for publication? So we ask them about the intellectual coherence, is the balance between chapters reasonable, are there any gaps, does it break your ground, is there anything competing? Is it suitable for publication by University Press? And what do you think peer reviewer about the market um, and the readership? Then we ask them to make one of three recommendations. One, I strongly recommend publication of this proposed book. Two, I believe it's got potential to be published following incorporation of amendments subject to further consideration. Or three, I don't think this book should be published. I would say for an ECR, you're probably looking at number two, basically revise and resubmit. Um, so what I try to do when I send a peer, peer review to an author, I always think there's somebody there at the end of um, looking at a computer screen, opening my email, waiting anxiously for this peer review. And I'm always very aware how much um, an academic's identity is very bound up with their work. So. We, tr we try and give guidance and support. So if that peer review is not quite what you're expecting, quite, not quite as positive, please don't be down 
hearted or discouraged and engage with the peer reviewer. And the best peer reviewers give fantastic guidance. They'll put the positive in and then they'll talk about the less positive aspects, which are normally to do with gaps in coverage or certain areas that haven't been covered. Maybe the structure needs looking at. Um, and I've seen books absolutely transformed by peer review. That first book from an ECR, engage with the peer reviewer. Um, if it's not quite what you're expecting and you're disappointed, try and sort of sit on it and live with it for a while. Think about it, mull it over, because what that then I'll ask you to do is um, send a formal response to me, which I'll share with Ardell and Luke, um, and I'll send that back to the peer reviewer. And what I'm looking for then is for them to give me further um, consideration, hopefully ending with, this looks great now, I'm really happy with this response. I would now recommend this book for publication. So there may be a period of dialogue between the press, um, you as an author and the peer reviewer, and that's perfectly normal. Even if you get, I don't recommend this book for publication, a good peer reviewer will tell you why not and suggest what needs to be done and how you can put it right. So it's not the end by any means. And I always like to give people an opportunity to come back, revise the proposal. It may need quite fundamental revision, but I always like to give people a chance. And again, it's about that dialogue, about keeping in touch with us and engaging with the peer reviewer. So yeah, all is not lost if um, you don't um, get the outcome that you wish for um, from a peer review. Once I've got that unequivocal recommendation to publish, I will then go to U UWP's executive meeting. And it's basically an overview of the proposal, who you are as an author, name of the book, um, description of the content and the peer review and we do a budget for the book as well and um, we've got such a meeting tomorrow morning actually then what we do we look at it again we say yep this fits looks good um, we will now move to contract so once that's done I always like that part of my job when I send people that email um, dear author I'm really pleased to tell you your book was approved for publication today by UWP and I'll now send you a contract with the contract, one of the major factors is obviously um, the extent. So if you tell me the book's going to be 90K, um, if it comes in at 150,000 words, we'll have to discuss how we can address that. But also the submission date. Um, we're a publisher, we have um, rolling um, publication programs. So think very carefully and don't be too optimistic. You know, academic life is such that it'll be, oh, hi, Sarah, I've just been told I've got to uh, teach three more classes this term. Um, so it's slowed up my research. And Ardell knows that one very well. Um, but always keep in contact with the publisher. If you give us advance notice, we can talk about it. Um, so keep in touch. I'm sure there's always loads of questions that an author has between contract and submission. Keep the questions coming in. You're never, never bothering us. So um, please do contact us. Also, nowadays you have to think about open access. Um, it's quite a big thing in the UK. We have this thing called the research um, um, exercise framework every seven or eight years. And for the next one, which is 2028, 29, um, open access is gonna be a big thing for humanities monographs. So it could be that your university has an open access mandate or your research is funded by um, an organization with an open access mandate. So if you've got an open access requirement, let us know and we can guide you through that um, and see where we can get some um, funding for it. Usually um, organizations with mandates come with funding as well. Um, as just talking now briefly about edited volumes, um, writing a chapter for an edited collection, I think that's a fantastic way for an ECR to get going, being in a, in a edited collection with some fantastic editors, that's a really good way um, to keep, um, to start publishing. And I would say that networking is really important, um, whether you're an ECR or not. And um, we just went to the Gothic conference in Dublin and Ardell and Luke were there, and it's a fantastic opportunity to have quite sort of informal chats about 
ideas and I can't tell you the number of books I've commissioned is on the back of a conference where, I, where I've literally been standing next to somebody in a break and you start chatting about their research and it turns into an, into an idea which turns into a proposal which turns into a book. So networking at conference is always um, recommended. Um, what else can I say? I think publishers always want to hear from you and just don't be reluctant to contact us. We want to hear from you. Even if it's an initial query, please do get in touch. Um, and just a bit more now, just when you, you've submitted your manuscript, um, we've had a look at it. We check the word count, by the way. I know people think we don't, but we do. We check the word count, we check the title. Uh, it could be that during research, uh, the title's changed a bit. So. When you sign the contract, it's not set in stone. We can always think about um, a new um, revised title. What we do then, we send the manuscript to the same peer reviewer who looks at the proposal stage. And basically what we're saying is, hi, peer reviewer, you recommended this at proposal stage. Does the manuscript bear out your confidence in this manuscript? And again, um, what we want is, yes, I do. Again, there could be some more dialogue. The manuscript might need some revision and what I do and other than very minor revisions I'll send it back to the peer reviewer to take a look because they're the experts in the field. So once all that's done and I've got a manuscript which is in UWP house style which I'll send to you at contract stage. Everything at that stage has to be set in stone. The title of the book, the price of the book, the series which we know it's going to be in case of QTI and then I will formally hand it over to um, sales and marketing department for Maria and her department to start publicising and marketing the book and also to the editorial and production department. Um, they'll send you a schedule telling you when there's key um, milestones in the journey of the book, for example when proofs are due, when the index is due, which is on second proofs when the page numbers are available and um, that's really over and that's over and out from the commissioning department. The book is now <laughs> sailing on to publication in the very able hands of my colleagues, um, in, including Maria. So Maria, I don't know if you want to add a yeah. word or two at this stage. Yeah, so um, so basically, um, as I'm sure you've picked up, there's a lot of different stages in the publishing process. Um, and as we're a small team, the nice thing about that is we're all intrinsically involved in those processes, which means that when Sarah brings something to the commissioning meeting, I'm sitting around the table, and I hear about it from that point onwards and then that goes into the schedule we know what's coming and then we have um, a series of meetings where you know we're deciding print runs and things like that um, my team there's myself my colleague Ellen who is our marketing and events manager and my colleague Georgia who's a sales and marketing assistant and I head the department and you might be thinking how can three people achieve global success well we work with a lot of partners around the world to do this so when um, Sarah tells, when Sarah gets to the point where we she can send your book to market, um, we then will send you a, mar a marketing questionnaire and we'll ask you all sorts of questions um, about your contacts, um, where you'd like to see your book reviewed, um, any events that you think your book could be applicable for. We don't expect you to know everything because we will do some we do the research as well. So we use your answers, but we put that in with our own databases and our own knowledge. Um, and that forms your marketing plan. Um, and we have this down to a bit of a T with kind of um, pretty much all of our series now on, on uh, that Sarah brings to us and the um, book, new books joining. Um, so, yes, there's obviously opportunities with conferences. Um, we support online events and we do lots of social media as well. Um, and we have... Um, that's kind of like the fun side of the marketing but then obviously there's the metadata side of the marketing as well so we you know we support you with um finding a good title so if sarah brings a title to the table and i look at it and think oh hang on a minute we could do some more keywords in there and make the discoverability better there may be some conversations around that um we'll, we'll do everything to the to make with the with the aim of making your book as discoverable as possible because it doesn't just go out in physical form it now go out goes out in e-form or it goes out in pdf form 
it's being um, distributed to lots of library supplies and things like that. So we just want it to stand up in the market as much as we can. Um, we also look at the cover very, um, um, that's something really intrinsic to us as a press. We like our, our monographs to look um, appealing. We like the covers to really pop and be, you know, to, to convey the kind of amazing subjects that are within within the book. So we do put a lot of time into our covers. We've got a very, very skilled production team. Um, and I don't know whether any of you have seen our Gothic Literary Studies series, but I would recommend um, having a look at that um, as, a, as an idea of the kind of work that we do on that basis. And I am involved in that choice as and the rest of the team are as well. So we can kind of get all angles of all of our heads in publishing around the table to, to get the best possible end product. Um, and then just a little note on distribution. So when I say we work with a lot of global partners, we, we're distributed by Ingram. Um, so they're obviously a US based company that distribute across um, everywhere in the world. They, they service all major um, e-providers, all major library suppliers, including EBSCO and Gobi, um, but everywhere, everyone in between that as well. Um, so your work would be available through those channels. Um, we have an arrangement in Australia and New Zealand with Wiley. Um, so they distribute us in those territories. Um, and we work in America, obviously, as Sarah and Ardell have said, um, with University of Chicago Press. Um, and they're a fantastic partner for um, academic monographs, especially. They go to the conferences in the US on our behalf. They take, you know, everybody, you know, all the different series with them. Um, and we work very closely with their marketing team and their publicity team to make sure that we get the reviews and we get everything going in the US as we would in the UK as well. Um, and everything is listed on Library of Congress, which I know is really, really important for US monographs. Um, we also have a rep force in um, Europe and they are uh, called Durnell. They work very hard for us and they make sure that all the books are seen by um, more of the physical, what I say, Ingram does a lot of the E and the um, sort of um, digital um, distribution um, and they carry the books physically as well. But we like our reps to go and see library suppliers individually. So we get the customer contact. So we have that in Europe, which is fantastic. Um, and that's kind of all the major European distributors um, are taken care of. And then we also work with Asian distributors, Middle Eastern and shortly South African. Um, and we're always looking to grow. Um, so I think from my side, that's everything that I had to say. Um, I'd also like to add as well, I'm an academic myself. I'm finishing a PhD at the moment. So I, I, I know what it's like to kind of be an early career researcher. Um, and I like to think that I treat the books on our list with that, with the knowledge that I have of being in the academic world. Thank you. Could I also add something? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, this is my first one from University of Wales Press, Queer Others in Victorian Gothic. But what I would like to tell um, um, Luke, can you folks, stop screen sharing so that we can see um, Ardell's? Oh, sorry. Cover? Yeah, hold that up one more time so we can see it a little bit better. Yeah, there it is. Thank anyway, you. but what I wanted to tell the participants, uh, you know, and the 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 folks listening and interested, this got rejected, I think, the first time. I had to revise a second time. There were more things that needed to be done. I think it was the third time. Sarah, I can't even remember now. And this was my first, uh, you know, monograph. I, I'd done another book. It was a collaboration, but it was different. Um, and this had come out of my doctoral thesis at Stanford. It's so different. The title that I have on this book now was not what I had when I originally started. Um, so many things changed. I had a chapter that was supposed to be in here that wound up not being in here because the book was going to be too long. And But I just want to say... You know, I'm I'm an example of this needed this, this, and this. And I could have just said, forget it. This thing's not going to ever get published. But I didn't. And um, 
they they pushed me in good ways. They were so helpful and supportive. And yeah, I had to redo the proposal. I do think it was three times, two or three times, but I got it. And I I feel like um, this book has been pretty successful. It's been out in the world for a decade. Um, and, you know, at least in, in queer Gothic, queer circles, Gothic circles, uh, people, I feel like it's held up pretty well. Um, but even now, I mean, I've got several essays and books under my publication belt. Uh, when I proposed the AIDS Gothic monograph, um, the reviewer also came back and said, well, here's some questions, you know, and so I answered those. Um, and now I'm under contract again with the University of Wales Press for that, which I'm thrilled. But I just want to say that I can't underscore enough how great the communication is and nurturing from this press. Um, again, you know, there are other presses. I won't name them. I've got two in mind in particular, though, who are an absolute bloody nightmare to work with. And, uh, you know, never again. Um, now, the University of Wales Press house style, okay, that was a learning curve, whatever. But you know what? It's good for you. Uh, it's always good to be pushed out, you know, away from MLA or APA or Chicago, whatever style, uh, and do that. Almost every press has their own house style. So anyway, you know, you just have to, and and you will wind up having to do uh, British spelling. I guess it's proper spelling. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so you, you have that. But other than that, um, but but in all seriousness, you know, don't get discouraged. We actually just had a manuscript where the peer reviewer uh, was like, this has some really interesting stuff, but this doesn't quite do it. Um, and we went back to the author and everybody worked. And actually, the author's now got something really, we think, awesome ready to happen. So I just don't get discouraged. Do not get discouraged. Um, I know we have several questions in the chat that I really, a couple of them I'm really uh, would love for us to get to. So and a couple of them are definitely for the uh, University of Wales Press team. But anyway, I just wanted to give my own encouragement there that, you know, I didn't just send off the um, proposal and Cha-ching, it was done and I got it. No, no. I think the first time I was, it was rejected. Like, no. And then I rewrote. They gave me the opportunity. They'll always give you the opportunity to rewrite. And then it was like, well, yeah, here's this and this and this. Because I like had cinema in there and something else. And I, no, you need to have this more narrowed. So I did. And, and then I got it. And you know what? They pushed me to be a better author, a better theorist. Uh, I'm, I'm actually very proud, especially of the new chapters that hadn't, they, they weren't in my dissertation, right? Um, and it was really great. So thank you. All right. That's all. I'd thank like to say that. just a couple words before we go to Q&A. Um, I have sure. several colleagues who have published at the University of Wales Press and have had uh, similar experiences, enjoyable experiences with, with the press. But uh, I also wanted to say with this Queer and Trans Intersection series, we know that there are presses in the United States like Duke and NYU, right? Uh, and the, uh, these very prestigious presses. But um, what we're trying to do in the UK is um, open up a series that is, there is no series in queer and trans studies in the UK, right? So this is something new for this area that is going to then um, be disseminated globally. So it's, it's, a, it's a new um, market in this region of the world. Um, and I, I think that's, that's an exciting prospect. Yeah, there's so much exciting work that you all are doing. And I want to thank you so much for sharing your enthusiasm and your knowledge and your um, encouragement with our audience. Um, Ardell answered a question that I was going to ask, which is tell us more about why um, working with University of Wales has been a good experience. Um, because I know that when I was a graduate student and, and an early career scholar, listening to the process um, that Sarah laid out was stressful um, and overwhelming, even though the press is supportive or Sarah you know, um, is supportive. And we do need to know 
it has to be transparent. We have to know that full process, but it's still overwhelming. So um, I was, well, we give people another moment to add more questions to the chat. I was going to ask Ardell to, to talk about why it has been a good experience working with University of Wales, but you've done that. Thank you. And Sarah, I wanted to know, um, what is step one? So I'm, say I'm, uh, I graduated um, with my PhD last spring. I have my dissertation in hand, but I feel nervous about the next step. What is what is the first step that I should think about doing to turn that into a book contract? I would say you could just send me an email or Ardell and Luke and me say, hi, I'm in the position um, that Law's just outlined. Um, I'm thinking about doing a book. Um, it's on this. What do you think? And we can engage in a conversation and we can sort of develop it bit by bit in a supportive way. But it's sending that first email to a publisher and to the series editors. So just write that email, press send, and we'll get back <laughs> yeah. to you. Thank you. That's such great advice. And I love that you said, I actually wrote this down, um, that publishers want to hear from you. We do. <laughs> We'd be in big trouble if we didn't. So we want to hear from you. And I know, um, you know, people. I think I don't know if it's um, all publishers, but you have this sort of monolithic idea of this sort of building with, you know, these sort of people inside who are making judgments and about your work. But we're quite friendly and approachable. I hope. Uh, just send us that email. And um, we'll do our very best to guide you through it. And I know the process is a bit sort of mind boggling, boggling and mind scrambling, but we'll um, talk you through it. Thank you, there, Sarah. Yeah. There was also already in the questions, <clears throat> there was also already an outstanding question about an introductory book possibility uh, with language translation, uh, Chinese, uh, English, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, something like that, that's a brilliant email to send and we'll be like, tell us more, right? So- Yeah, so Arda, let me read that because I'm not sure that the um, attendees can see the questions. So um, oh. this question came in and said, I noticed that the University of Wales Press is interested in producing introductory volumes. May I ask if you are interested in an edited volume that features the key words of gender and sexualities flowing between the English and Chinese speaking words? Um, and so that's what Ardell was referring to. I probably have to discuss that with Ardell and Luke. Um, it sounds more like a sort of linguistic book. Um, I guess if you had a monograph or an edited collection on that subject, you might put a glossary in the book. Um, but also, um, I probably, I'd have to speak to Ardell and Luke and to Maria as well. You know, does it actually fit the series? It sounds interesting. Um, but I suppose what we're looking for is long form work, either, either as monographs or edited collections. Just one thing I, I was going to mention when I was doing my presentation, which I overlooked. If you've got quotes of other languages in your book, whether it's Spanish or Chinese or Arabic, always translate them into English because that will broaden your market because not everybody who reads your book will be able to access the language. So mm -hmm. I'd always advise to do that either in the text itself or in a, in a note, uh, but any quote that you put in, in Spanish, um, Arabic, um, translate it into English and that will broaden the appeal of the book. Maria's got a hand up. Okay. Oh sorry I don't know if I did that I think I've done that accidentally but I'm but yeah I'm just <laughs> I, I will concur with everything that, Sa that Sarah, um, Sarah said. Um, I think um, we like to hear different ideas having you know we do like to hear different ideas and sometimes they might not fit immediately but there's sometimes when Sarah brings it to the table for the rest of us to talk about there may be different areas or avenues that that could be created from that first idea from that initial idea so and I think publishing is um it's a creative business it's a people business and that's you know we do a lot of things by communicating and talking internally with each other but also then with the authors as well because of the or the editors and you know because that's that's our extended family almost it's the most important part of what we do 
And so there's one other quick question in the chat that asks if the press is interested in auto theoretical and auto fictional works. And this might also be a question for Ardell and Luke in terms of this particular series. Is that something that you all are open to? I don't understand the question completely. Um, could, um, could Brian um, say a little bit more about- now, Brian, if you're still here, I can let you speak um, if you wanna ask. But my, my understanding is that perhaps Brian was asking about whether the press only publishes sort of non-fictional critical theory texts. Brian, you can go ahead and, and talk. Mm -hmm. If you're talking, you're muted. Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Brian, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, um, I guess just following the works of people like Mackenzie Work, um, she writes about uh, one of her books is Reverse Cowgirl and she works at the New School of Research, of Social Research. Um, and I have written a bit about auto fiction and auto theory, um, particularly uh, in my experience as a gay man in Guatemala. Um, but I was wondering if you were interested in works that kind of draw from the personal in a more um, obvious way. I personally think some of the most amazing um, theoretical works, et cetera, do have the personal within them. Um, I mean, I can think about, you know, this is old school, okay. But I'm thinking about, uh, you know, some of Audre Lorde's, um, not poetry, but essays, mm, poetry as well. Sheri Moraga, uh, Gloria Ansadua, obviously, right? Again, I, I warned you all, I'm going old school, that's 80s. Um, but I think, uh, Brian, that that, I mean, that's a unique voice to me, what you were talking about. And that is something that, um, I mean, in, in the brief question itself, it's what I would say is, wow, that sounds really amazing. And can we, talk more right like oh, I'd love to see more of the ideas on this and whatnot I think that this is fabulous I mean Quoley Driscoll for instance they also very much employ um personal theoretical auto theoretical as you say both in Asagi stories even in their book of poetry walking with ghosts etc and in the indigenous uh, the queer indigenous studies reader I mean that that's part of it. So I also think this is so critical and important because that kind of writing and that narrative and et cetera, that is purposefully and has been for, again, I go back to Lord Moraga and Antaldua, et cetera. It is pushing against very directly these notions of what is theory, right? It's white or Eurocentric, right? That I mean, I personally, as a grad student, remember being, again, I'm, I'm 58, okay? But I'm totally remembering, you know, everybody, Sixou, Irigure, okay, great, great. You know, the French feminists, yay. But it's like somehow that was only one kind of a theory, you know, and that uh, queer and trans people of color weren't really writing theory, which of course is utter bullshit. Uh, of course they were. And that when that personal, excuse my language, but when the personal, uh, comes in <clears throat> because that is the personal being political in a very different, much deeper, more intersectional level. I personally uh, would love to see more from what, what you're asking. I mean, I think that this could be really, really amazing. Thanks for, um, I had to be reminded of what auto theory is, Brian. Um, now I have an under, understanding of what you're talking about. I think that um, work like this could be quite useful in the series, but I'm not sure how much um, University of Wales Press works with, with this type of publication. Uh, Sarah or Maria, could you speak on that? Auto um, theory? 
I think we'd have to see more about it actually to be honest it looks really interesting sounds really interesting but I think I'd have to maybe see some um sample material really so we could take a look about uh, you know how you're trying to um uh, get to the material that you're talking about and how you propose to write about it so I think in principle it sounds you know as Ardell and Luke say it sounds really interesting but I think we need to um, explore it a bit more yeah yeah I think seeing more is always good if it's a you know yeah and I think we're not we're not sort of we do lots of uh, lots of different titles on niche parts of interdisciplinary or any subjects we're not scared of we're not scared of theory we're not scared of um that kind of thing so it's just more about having all the facts I suppose before we can make a, like a really informed decision um and I suppose that's part of the publishing process Okay, great. So um, we have another question, you know, we've been talking about what the press um, would be interested in publishing and what they norm normally do work with, but um, we have a question about uh, what the, what Luke and Ardell believe to be the specific new directions, trends and nuances that they think are the most crucial and cutting edge. Um, in queer and trans studies, what are the things you'd be really excited to see come uh, come um, into your inbox in, for this series? Well, I, I know that that question was framed in that a lot of this research has already been happening in the last decade, and that's true. But this is a book series, and um, most of these uh, most of the research that I've seen in queer ecologies or decolonial queer studies are coming out in journals and journal articles and so what i'd like to see is um uh more exposure especially from a uk press um in in these areas that we've outlined in the presentation in in, in queer ecologies and decolonial studies and um and, and diasporas and um especially in the wake of covid 19 understanding medicine and how um queer and trans populations are are treated in healthcare. Um, the politics involved in queer and trans um, identities and, and in giving agency, uh, especially I'm thinking in terms of um, uh, these uh, moves by autocrats around the world uh, to censor uh, queer and trans identities and agencies and, and what people are thinking about that. And, um, and in and global media and uh, the way that um, communities are being forged. So I know that those ideas uh, for the last decade have been discussed. That's what I was trying to reiterate by uh, showing, you know, since 2016, some conferences, uh, round tables, keynotes that have been given. But uh, I think that these conversations are still ongoing and relatively new. And I haven't seen an abundance of books, even from Duke University Press on these issues. And so that's what we would like to see, um, and I would like to see in the series anyway. I'm gonna go off Freire and forgive me. Still old school. Um, I don't know. That's the thing, I'm open, right? We're open. We, we had some ideas there, but again and again and again, and this is what happens in my teaching, whatever I've thought of, it's never as good as what actually comes in. And so, you know, there may be something that we absolutely need that we don't even know about. Um, you know, I'm sorry to be so waffly with it. Uh, yeah, I do want to underscore, and I, I put this in the Q&A, um, the answers, that yes, even when you have some volumes or one, you know, a journal uh, dedicated to something, or you're getting books uh, about these issues, there's always room. I mean, think about other topics in the world that have, you know, 2 million books associated with them and people are still writing on it, you know. Um, sorry, but like Shakespeare comes to mind. Uh, you know, something like that. And I think that particularly with queer and trans theory, so important to have those foundational texts, right? But, okay, great. Here's this foundation. 
we see the issues, we've got the definitions, et cetera. And then how do we keep going? I mean, that's one of the reasons I believe that Munoz's, uh, one of his last books actually um, on, on queer, right? Queer futurities, et cetera. It, it did something different, you know, and maybe we didn't even know we needed that. Um, and so that, you know, we're open. We're open, it's interdisciplinary. And, you know, I, I don't know, but this is a really brand new series and a creative space, you know, to, to hear the ideas, et cetera. Sorry, yeah, that wasn't specific. I would add that, like, I, if, if people, participants here have ideas and you want to put them in the q and uh, that would be exciting. You know, what do you think is missing or um, the next frontier of this field? Um, and while you're doing that, I just, I think that this question actually was answered after the, the person um, wrote it, but um, just to clarify, Sarah, does um, the University of Wales Press do advanced book contracts by reviewing CV prospectus and sa sample chapters? When you mean an advanced book contract, can you just explain? So you you do do you do um, a contract before the complete manuscript is submitted? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yeah. And your requirement. Yeah, we understand no no author is going to want to write a manuscript if they haven't got a contract in place and a high element of certainty. You know, you're not going to spend your time doing something, submit a whole manuscript, and then a publisher might say, well, thanks, but no. Uh, so it would have been through all the evaluate, um, evaluation stages that we discussed, including um, Luke and Ardell's opinion, opinion of colleagues here at the press from various different perspectives, um, marketing included, the peer reviewer. So when we're all those people are happy, we will then contract. Sometimes people have the manuscript ready. You know, okay, I do get emails from scholars saying, hey, I've got this manuscript ready, but we go through the same process. It, it's a bit shorter, obviously, if you've got manuscript to hand, they may have to do some revisions, but certainly once it's been through the um, procedures, it's been peer reviewed, we've got that yes published from the peer reviewer, we will contract the book. And then just to reiterate, the manuscript goes out for peer review when it's ready. Yeah, I, I also want to add that, I mean, that's one of the things is I think it's very difficult and I'm, I'm speaking to you all as graduate students and I, I remember what that was like and people, you know, having their thesis and shopping the whole thing or, or whatever, um, at least in the U.S. that can be very stressful. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure CLAGS is fantastic, but also there's a certain way as graduate students it's like uh it almost feels like you know you have to beg for somebody to publish your thing or whatever um that's at least was my experience in particular ways what is fantastic is no i mean i haven't had a whole manuscript either time i've landed a contract with wales um i had for queer others in victorian gothic i had the full outline again i had to go through three revisions but it happened uh, my CV, the outline, et cetera, robust, and it passed. The last time um, for the AIDS Gothic book that I'm just starting, um, you know, the detailed uh, table of content outline, all the other questions. Some of the questions, by the way, on the University of Wales Press uh, questionnaire, you're not going to maybe know how to answer. Um, and just let Sarah know, hey, I don't even know how to do this. And she'll probably say, you don't need That's to worry fine. about that one, uh, right? Uh, you may not know every marketing place or whatever. You don't need to, right? Just some ideas. Um, and then um, and then you're under contract. Uh, and and in both cases, you know, I've had to, I had to ask for for queer others. I had to ask for an extra year. I was in constant conversation with the press, um, you know, and and with the AIDS Gothic, they're already on notice that I'm probably going to have to ask for extra time and they'll probably give it to me. Uh, but anyway, so I guess in that way, yeah, it is an advanced contract in that way. You don't have to have the whole manuscript there. And, and what's nice about this is 
that you don't have an entire manuscript and it's rejected and you feel like beaten down by that or whatever, you've got a contract by doing this really robust proposal, okay? Uh, you're under contract, right? And, and it's going to change. Like I said, I, I had to kick one of my authors to the curb um, and add somebody else and all this other stuff. And the press are very, very flexible with that sort of uh of work going on and uh great at communication i i'd like to actually add uh, two things and one is that i know a lot of people i talked to and myself in the past have done the first step you know emailed someone at the press um spoken at a conference and then said oh i'll get you my my book proposal in one month Right. And then I don't because life happens and we have things uh, come up. And then uh, I feel like, oh, well, I missed the boat. I can't ever contact them again. And right. And, and so that is not, you know, don't do that. <laughs> We're seeing a lot of no's. Right. Um, I think that what I'm hearing from Sarah and from everyone today is that communication is really important, that um Presses are much more understanding of the things that academic life throws at us than we imagine. And they also know that as writers, sometimes things just don't materialize the way we plan. So um, I was struck by Sarah mentioning uh, not to be too optimistic about your stated time frame for submission of your full manuscript, but also um, even if you get to that less optimistic deadline, if you can't do it on that very date, I, once again, not all is lost. Like, of course, they want to keep to a like a, a fairly realistic time frame, but communication is is the key, I think, to making sure that like you don't just yeah. Do. Tell, tell if you're running late, tell tell the publisher. Um, I'd say the only time when deadlines are really important, say if you're if you've got a book and there's an anniversary or an event that the book needs to coincide with. Um, there's no point publishing it after the event. It needs to be published before Maria can add probably more than I do at this stage. But, you know, if you say I'm going to send you a proposal, my proposal in a month and it doesn't appear, it's never going to be, well, don't darken our doors ever again. We'll just say, yeah, you need a bit more time. That's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, we have, we be have kind on yourself and be realistic yeah. about everything you've got to do. As Laura says, life happens. And I say this in the in the best way, and I think it makes um, why it makes publishing so interesting. It's human endeavor. You know, books don't get written by a machine that might break down. We're talking about humans with, um, you know, we see the sort of outer face, the face that you um, present to the world as a scholar, but there's life going on um, that you navigate as much as your professional life. So, you know, it's messy, but I say that in a, in a nice supportive way. We're all human beings and it's human endeavor and it's not tidy and it doesn't slot nicely into, you know, no. grids or stuff. So, yeah, mm. we recognize that. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, we do have checks and balances in place to to cope with that as well. So if something is late and, you know, that there, there are things we there are ways we can work around that, that, no, you know, it, there's there's never a fire. We can always put the fire out. So, yeah. Well, and, and for me, I mean, my son was having his third open heart surgery. That was part of what informed why queer others had to be a year later. And um, right now I would say that the presses I'm working with have been incredibly generous. They're smaller university presses, right? Uh, and they have been incredibly generous during this whole COVID mess. Because that has really uh, changed timelines for people, you know, and and I think that, again, that communication is the key. When you're with a really large press, they may get back to you, they may not. But that's the thing is that you see who's with the press here today. This is who you email and this is who you talk to. Um, and they will get back to you, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, 
great. Uh, so we have another question that just came in. How long does it usually take from the submission of a complete manuscript um, out for external review to the final publication in at the press? Generally, um, we get the manuscript in and I will check it, make sure that word count is correct. I'll ask a colleague. Um, also, we get an editorial review to check it against house style. I will then contact the peer reviewer, or if I know it's coming, I'll contact them in advance. Hi, peer reviewer, you, you um, reviewed this at proposal stage, you've got the manuscript now. Um, peer reviewers being very busy people, um, we give them probably about eight to 10 weeks, but we'll always work with their timeline. You know, if they say, actually, oh, I need 12, we'll do it. But also they're very busy people, so they may not be able to get around to your manuscript immediately. But say if we say, I don't know, two, three months for the peer review, what happens then very much depends on what needs to be done for the manuscript. If it's um, very minor corrections, an author might be able to turn them around in a few weeks. If it needs some rewriting, that may take a few months. And then I may need to send the um, manuscript back to the peer reviewer to check. We're looking for that unequivocal recommendation to publish. So that is a very sitting on the fence kind of way, which I hope helps in a way. You, took, you know, you're relying on other people to do work for you. People are busy. It depends what the peer review says. If it's minor corrections, it can be quick. Then what we also have to do is, again, this is Maria's field. We work with the very long lead in times that the University of Chicago Press have for their seasonal mm -hmm. catalogues. So I can't remember when we did it, um, Maria, was it sort of April that mm. we announced everything up to, when was it? Summer 23? Summer 23, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they insist on those lead times because they have to, that's how the American kind of library system works. They want to know about books that far in advance. Um, so we try to meet those deadlines so we can get the most exposure possible for all of our books. Yeah, so that's a very important factor and our production schedule is generally about, about nine months. Um, mm -hmm. That's because um, we use all your, uh, your manuscripts will be copy edited by a professional. Um, there's lots of quality, you, can, you know David um, Ardell, mm -hmm. our editor. Um, it's loads and loads of quality control, which takes time. Um, and also there's the Chicago press lead in time. So. If everything goes smoothly, if you send me a manuscript, um, where we know, let's say 1st of November, peer reviewer looks at it immediately in eight weeks. You only need a month to turn it around. That's three months. And then the production schedule and the lead-in times to Chicago, I would say about 12 months if everything goes like clockwork. But it very, it very much depends on what the peer review says, you know, how much work it or not is needed at that stage. Thank you. Um, did you have something to add, Maria? Or no, I think that was everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so we are just about out of time. We have about two minutes left. And I, I just want to thank all of you for taking this time to uh, bring up the trends and futures of queer and trans studies to draw our attention to this exciting series that is coming out um, to encourage people to submit whether they're um, they have dissertations that they're turning into a monograph or early career scholars or advanced career scholars this is um, something that is a great opportunity for everyone I know that I'm excited so um, thank you all so much. And I'm gonna put the donate link for CLAGS in the chat one more time. And I also want to let everybody know about our upcoming programming from CLAGS. We have actually a, an event tonight. So one of the arms of CLAGS is that we do fellowships. And so tonight we have a panel for the awardees for the Sylvia Rivera Award in Transgender Studies. Um, there's a registration link that is um, East Coast time, 7.30 p.m. 
And then our next event is coming up on Monday, and that is the awardees for um, the Monat Horowitz Dissertation Award. So um, if you, and this is something that I encourage all of you to submit for, these are prestigious fellowships and um, really are wonderful ways to get your work um, out there and have make people aware of what you're doing and how you're intervening in the field. And the last thing I will say is that we also do an annual Kessler Award. Our awardee for the Kessler Award this year um, is Juana Maria Rodriguez. And Juana will be speaking in person at CLAGS on December 8th. And we will also be live streaming. So please uh, keep that in mind and join us. Um, you can find CLAGS on social media these days. You can sign up for a newsletter, but we're also on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at CLAGS NY. So thanks again to everyone and uh, keep an eye out for the recording of this and share it with everyone you know. It will be posted on our CLAGS YouTube channel soon. Um, so have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. The yeah, absolute Thank pleasure. You. Yeah, Thank lovely. So Thank great. you. Thank you. Hey, Laura, <clears throat> excuse me, do you have one second? Um, yes. Hold on. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>